I'm Ed Nersessian, director of the Helix Center, and I want to welcome you to today's program on Elizabeth Bishop that was organized by the chair of our poetry uh, program, uh, David Pollens, who will introduce the uh, participants. Just to tell you the programs we have planned, on April 13th, we have a program on music, emotion, and mind. On April 27th, the program is on curiosity and ignorance. And on, I think it's May 10th or something like that, we have a program, uh, what's that one? No, it's not on memory. <laughs> it's on forgetting. Should be, should be on memory. Uh, oh, it's a program on, on a subject we all need to learn more about, which is synthetic and uh, systemic biology. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody to our talk today about Elizabeth Bishop. Uh, we have a fabulous group of poets and scholars and editors all deeply connected to the work of Elizabeth Bishop. I'll introduce them. Uh, Bonnie Costello is a professor at Boston University. Uh, she's here on my right. She's the author of uh, Marion Moore, Imaginary Possessions, Elizabeth Bishop, Questions of Mastery, and the general editor of The Selected Letters of Marion Moore. <coughs> Her more recent literary studies include Shifting Ground and Planets on Tables. Ms. Costello is currently working on Pronoun Trouble, Auden and Others in the First Person Plural. Alice Quinn is the Executive Director of the Poetry Society of America and an adjunct professor at the Graduate School of the Arts at Columbia University. She was the poetry editor of The New Yorker for two decades and before that was an editor at Alfred Knopf. Ms. Quinn compiled a collection of Elizabeth Bishop's unpublished work in Edgar Allan Poe and the Jukebox, Uncollected Poems, Drafts, and Fragments, which appeared in 2006. She's currently preparing a collection of Elizabeth Bishop's journals and notebooks. Lloyd Schwartz is the Frederick S. Troy Professor of English at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. In addition to being a poet and literary critic, Mr. Schwartz is the classical music editor of the Boston Phoenix and a regular commentator on NPR's Fresh Air. In 1994, he received the Pulitzer Prize for Criticism for his writing on music. He is co-editor of Elizabeth Bishop and Her Art, a collection of essays on the poet and the Library of America's edition of her collected works, Elizabeth Bishop, Poems, Prose, and Letters. His own poems have been included in the Best American Poetry and the Pushcart Prize anthologies. Jean Valentine, sitting between Lloyd and Alice. Her first book, Dream Barker and Other Poems, won the Yale Younger Poets Prize in 1965. Door in the Mountain, New and Collected Poems, 1965-2003, won the National Book Award in 2004. And her most recent book, Break the Glass, was a finalist for the 2011 Pulitzer Prize. Ms. Valentine has received grants and fellowships from the Rockefeller Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Guggenheim Foundation. She's been awarded the Shelley Memorial Award for the Poetry Society of America and the Wallace Stevens Award by the American Academy of Poets. She was the State Poet of New York from 2008 to 2010. So if people saw the announcement for today's event, they can see that attention was drawn to Elizabeth Bishop's powers of observation, which has been noted by um, many of the people who've read her poet poetry closely. And I'm just going to make a couple of comments about that. Um, I'll just quote some things that she has said. In referring to her maternal grandmother, she says, my grandmother had a glass eye, blue, almost like her other one. And this made her especially vulnerable and precious to me. My father was dead, and my mother was away in a sanatorium. Until I was teased out of it, I used to ask grandmother when I said goodbye to promise me not to die before I came home. And then about her paternal grandfather, she said, he was wall-eyed. At least one eye turned the wrong way, which made him endlessly interesting to me. And then in a letter to her from Robert Lowell, he says, no eye in the world has seen what yours has. And starting with that up, Turn to our participants to 
respond. If I could just add one little anecdote. Mm -hmm. um, Robert Lowell introduced uh, Elizabeth Bishop uh, when she was giving a reading at the Guggenheim Museum, and he referred to her famous eye. And when she got, when she got on stage, uh, she announced that the famous eye will now put on her glasses. <laughs> Trying to think before uh, downstairs, where it was that we read Mary McCarthy, Vassar classmate's description of Bishop's eye as like a great magnifying glass, and uh, and she said, of course the forfeit would would be that you'd have to look at everything with that eye. So I think she thought Bishop was a little touchy. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll play sort of uh, counterpoint to this just a bit because. Uh, I was drawn to Bishop as a great describer. Uh, I had been reading Marianne Moore for a long time, and Marianne Moore, as probably some of you know, was kind of a mentor to Elizabeth Bishop. Uh, and uh, I have always loved description in poetry. Um, but I think one of the things that happened is that Bishop was such a great describer uh, that people's highest tribute to her was her accuracy. Uh, and they missed often how deeply intelligent her poems are, how much psychological resonance they have. Um, when I teach Bishop, I love to uh, pass around a New Yorker cartoon uh, that Steinberg, uh, Saul Steinberg did, and it's of a man in the middle of a spiral, and at the end of the spiral, he's got a pen in his hand, and at the end of the spiral, there's a landscape. You know, but it spins back to him, and that always made me think about Bishop. That 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 to describe something is always to find out something about yourself, um, to uh, to um, come back to the self in some new way. That you can't know about the self only by turning inward, but it's this constant engagement with the sensorum, with the visual field, especially in Bishop's case. I think that. Uh, that, that, that enriches that knowledge. And uh, it can be self-forgetful, of course, uh, loss of self through engagement with the, with the visual world. But um, I think ultimately the knowledge of the self comes back. And so um, uh, I think often critics, there was a, a kind of, um, not damning with faint praise, but, a, but a, a, a lack of recognition of the profundity of her poetry, because there was so much attention to its visual accuracy mm -hmm. at first. So it's just a little counterpoint, maybe, to, to just, And just to go back to what Alice was saying about the, what Mary McCarthy said, I, it made me think of this passage in Crusoe in England. Mm -hmm which is, uh, if you don't know the poem, it's one of Bishop's most ambitious and one of her longest poems. And it's a poem in the voice of Robinson Crusoe. It's also, it seems to me, one of her most autobiographical mm -hmm. poems. Mm -hmm. And there's this amazing moment, a kind of chilling moment, where Robinson Crusoe says, and, and, and part of the autobiographical background is that Bishop lived in Brazil for many years, almost 20 years. Uh, you know, you could call it an exile, and you could call it a, a, a kind of salvation in some ways. Mm -hmm. But she says, uh, but he says, Crusoe mm -hmm. says, I'd have nightmares of other islands stretching away from mine, infinities of islands, islands spawning islands, like frogs' eggs turning into polywogs of islands, knowing that I had to live on each and every one, eventually for ages, registering their flora, their fauna, their geography. So that, that sense that the, the, the price of seeing everything so clearly is that you had to see everything, and, and there was no way of stopping. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think Jean is going to read, you, you, you were thinking of reading North Haven, the poem to Robert Lowell, but um, in, oh, in Bishop's last notebook, um, her last formal notebook, there are other little, um, little notebooks she carried around, but uh, she is up early in the morning in North Haven, sitting on the porch at about six o'clock, and she's decided to take the uh, wildflower guide 
and to write down the name of every flower that she can see from the porch. And it's about this many flowers, but it's preceded by her writing, I want, now that it's too late, to learn the name of everything. <laughs> she really did have that mm -hmm. delight. Right. Like, yeah. Bonnie talked about critics praising Bishop's accuracy and not her depth. And there's a wonderful passage in a draft that I think Alice discovered or found at, at Vassar of some sort of t lecture that, or article that Bishop was going to give and never finished. Um, it's called... Um, Writing poetry is an impossible. <laughs> Writing poetry is impossible. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and she says in this, and I think it's... This is the this is the the statement that we should all remember Bishop making because it's I think it's a profound it's profoundly self reflect reflexive. She says she talks about the qualities she admires in the poetry she likes most mm. are accuracy, right. spontaneity, and mystery. And what an amazing yeah. conglomeration of different and yet overlapping things. And, and of course, it's very, it's very funny about, I mean, she's sort of so famous for being accurate. And yet, <laughs> we know, those of us who have really have studied her poems, that she was perfectly capable of making things up and was very nervous 80 about... 80-watt bulbs and things like that, right? Yeah, and... <laughs> Has and... anybody ever seen an 80-watt light bulb? <laughs> <laughs> well, she, in, in one of her really greatest poems, uh, In the Waiting Room, she talks about this issue of the National Geographic, which was the issue that came out on her seventh birthday. And she describes in detail all these things that are in that issue. And they're not in that issue. Uh, and that, that people have written articles about, you know, the half a dozen issues of the National Geographic that came out the, the year of her seventh birthday, where a lot of these things are there, but they're not in the February 1918 issue. But it's true to memory. It's true to memory. Memory does that, too. Right. So but she, but yeah. yeah, except that she knew <laughs> yeah. she was making this up, and as Alice said, she was really worried about the New Yorker fact checkers. <laughs> and, and, and they did check. And she but Howard said, just <laughs> right, 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 right. But I heard they told her, well, you've got, what's the thing when you have time wrong with the Crusoe and words? Anachronism. Anachronism. Yeah. Yeah. And she said, I know. <laughs> Right. Yes, Ro she has in that poem in Crusoe in England. She has Robinson Crusoe trying to remember a line that is a famous line by Wordsworth, and the New Yorker fact checkers pointed out that Wordsworth came much later, you know, the next century, la or you know, in the next century from Robinson Crusoe. That's and, the point, and, right? And she said, "Yeah, I, I, I know." <laughs> Um, I love the uh, tense of I shan't have lied. Mm -hmm. Even losing you, I shan't have lied. It's again. very bizarre. Who says shan't anyway? <laughs> yeah. But where is that? Yeah, right. Where right. is that in time? Right, right. That was a throwback, wasn't it, to her yes. grandparents, do you think? Yeah. yeah. Well, the I same as the phrase safe as houses, that's a very old fashioned safe as phrase. Houses, yeah. My grandmother used to say safe as houses. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. But, and your grandmother was from. English. <laughs> English. My English but, but grandmother. All, oh, this yeah, was English, not the Canadian. No, not the Canadian one, the English one. Yeah. yeah. yeah so. One of the things that we were talking about, the temporality of, um, of the Crusoe poem, and uh, when we, if we think about Bishop as a visual poet primarily, um, uh, we not only want to remind ourselves uh, of the profundity, of the accumulated meaning uh, that's 
coming through detail rather than some imposition of symbols into the poem. Mm -hmm. but, um, but we also, um, I think, want to be aware that while she's a great describer, she also has a, a sense of time in motion. And often her landscapes will be surprisingly, they'll be like time lapses. You know, you can feel spring happening as she's describing a hill. Uh, we're often in this kind of space that's half time and half space, mm -hmm. you know, that is the space of the mind, partly. Yeah. Um, and there are many poems that do that. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a little unsettling at times because you get disoriented in, you know, wh what is the, uh, What's the, the, sequence? the standard here, you know, or the, uh, the measure. Uh, but she's so interested in that, the sort yeah. of psychology of space. And, um, but maybe disoriented is okay. Beg your pardon? Maybe disoriented is okay. Well, it's a place of discovery, certainly, right? Yeah, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking of that. Uh, distorted and revealed. Darwin <laughs> passage, you know? Yeah. Maybe yeah. Does somebody have that to read? That, that, that I do be? have it to read. Yeah. yeah. I didn't mean to. No, no, interrupt. please. This I think is from a letter to Anne Stevenson, who wrote the first book on Bishop and sent her lots of questions in Brazil. And Bishop sent her back a. A, a very significant, manifestly important letter, about seven pages long, and this is a passage. Oh, this is a bit long, but I think it's worth it. It's not terribly long. Um, just the gap between the observed world and the unknown, uh, the psychic one, is something that disturbs Bishop in her early work, <clears throat> and something that only long experience helped her to overcome. Thirty years later, she's able to speak as if there were no conflict. There is no split. This is uh, Bishop. Uh, dreams, works of art, some. Glimpses of moments of empathy, is it? Catch a peripheral vision of whatever it is. One can never really see full face but that seems enormously important. I can't believe we are wholly irrational, and I do admire Darwin, but reading Darwin, one admires the beautiful, solid case being built up of his endless, heroic observations, italicized, almost unconscious or automatic. And then comes a sudden relaxation, a forgetful phrase, and one feels the strangeness of his undertaking, sees the lonely young man, his eyes fixed on facts and minute details, sinking or sliding giddily off into the unknown. What one seems to want in art, she goes on, in experiencing it, is the same thing that is necessary for its creation, a self-forgetful, perfectly useless concentration. <laughs> it's good, isn't it? <laughs> but when you said disorienting, I thought of them. Yeah. Thank you. And you know, one of the things I love about that passage that you reinforced in the way you really performed it for us is how she's always in the moment when she's writing so that there are all these interjections, the parentheses, the questioning of what she's just asserted. The, so that, that, you know, there's so many ways that Bishop achieves that in poetry, sometimes by using a, um, a word like here, mm -hmm. uh, where you just become very present in whatever the thought process is. And uh, I think even, even there, where she's answering a question from a literary critic, <laughs> yeah. you feel her kind of yeah. thinking it through anew. Uh, so it's very exciting. And it's like her poems in that way. Yeah. That, yeah. Well, you, you, you remind me of another really famously great passage in Bishop, the end of uh, At the Fish Houses. Mm. Uh, she's visiting in Nova Scotia, and she uh, has this kind of um, epiphany at the, at the end of the poem, and where she's, uh, uh, she's dipping her hand in the cold Atlantic, and, and it's as if the water were a transmutation of fire. And then, this is the conclusion of the poem. It is like what we imagine knowledge to be. 
dark, salt, clear, moving, utterly free, drawn from the cold, hard mouth of the world, derived from the rocky breasts forever, flowing and drawn, and since our knowledge is historical, flowing and flown. Which is really kind of playing with grammar. Mm -hmm. Flown is not the past tense of flowing. Yeah. But it's 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 everything is moving. Nothing mm -hmm. is right. static. Right. And and her poems are have that quality that and it's really it, and it's kind of a quality and I think it's one of her great qualities, one of the great qualities in her poems is that she is living through them. Mm. It's not just something, and you, as, as you said before, and you've written wonderfully about her questioning yes. in, in yeah. poems, that nothing is fixed, right. and life is something we experience as something constantly changing and never simple. And, and I think there's an embrace of that so yes. that the skepticism is not a negative skepticism. Mm -hmm. Modernism skepticism can be very negative. Mm -hmm. And hers is a, an interrogative mode mm -hmm. of skepticism, yeah. more than a, yeah. a negative, harsh rupture. And as you've said also, I think it's a way of bringing herself home. It's a yeah. way of finding out. Right. The questions are ways of right. coming in. Right. I love that. Yeah. You know, Franny Blau, her friend, quoted in, I think it was the oral biography, she said, uh, it was later in life that Bishop said to her, I think we're all, I think the world is a mess and we're all sub-primitive, but we have to be gay in spite of it. Right. Mm -hmm. it kind of, um, you know, that passage in the poem, Lloyd, um, it is like what we imagine knowledge to be is embedded in her notebooks from the trip that she took um, to Nova Scotia, to Raggedy Island Inn, that place. Oh. And, uh, her publisher was pursuing her with the copies of her first book, <laughs> and she escaped to Nova Scotia. <laughs> and she always made it very hard for her Houghton Mifflin editor to do anything right. And so anyhow, she passed on the ferry, the sanatorium, where her mother had been incarcerated from the time she was five until she graduated from Vassar. And in the notebooks, it, it, she writes, um, I passed the sanatorium where mother was. I, 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 I hadn't prepared for this, mm. which really mm. seems amazing when you read it. I mean, yeah. that's the way you get to that place. And, mm. uh -huh. and then following that, almost immediately, she writes, it is, it is like what we imagine knowledge to mm. be. So I think oh, it has a kind yeah. of tragic oh oh, wow. undertone or overtone yeah. for her. And, yeah. and that same trip, in the notebook, she has the millions of grains are black, white, tan, and rose oh, mixed with quartz grains. Sandpiper. Rose and amethyst mm -hmm. from her poem, of, mm -hmm. her self-portrait poem, Sandpiper, which is such mm -hmm. a great poem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but I think some of that power of observation that we've been commenting on has to do probably with a vigilance. Um, so perhaps we think she ought to have anticipated passing the sanitarium on the way to the island, but she wasn't conscious of it. She wasn't yeah, thinking about yeah, it. Yeah. And yet some part of her mind was probably right. prepared right. and yet also shocked yes. uh, mm -hmm. um, by that experience yeah. of passing by. Yeah. You know, that gives me a chance to quote something that I found so fascinating when I, th these are all from, these are little quotes from, from an early notebook um, it, that starts in Cuddy Hunk, which is where Godnold, uh, account says Shakespeare set the tempest in Cuddy Hunk, this little island off of New Bedford. And she went there with her, her friend, the only man in her life other than her friend Tom Waning, mm -hmm. Bob Seaver, who um, was the brother of, of a friend, Barbara Chesney, I think from Vassar. And he loved her and gave her his fraternity pin and he wanted to marry her. And he killed himself, and she got a postcard three days after he died saying, go to hell, Elizabeth. I mean, it was, it was one of her early, really horrible tragedies. But she, she quotes him, and you can see how much she loved other people's observations. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And, and this, this, again, goes back to Sandpiper. Um, Bob said at Nantucket once, the water where the waves come in on a coarse rolling gravel, that it sounded like fat sputtering in a pan. 
the water behind Mrs. Crane's house coming in in short sliding waves on sand, he said sounded like someone's shoveling snow. <laughs> well, this turns up in Sandpiper. This is 1934, 1962, Sandpiper, you know, the little Sandpiper running along. The beach hisses like fat. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. on his left and interrupting, a sheet of interrupting water. I mean, these images, and they, she really thought in images. Yeah. And they stayed with her for forever. And um, the entries about New York City in the Depression years are fantastic. And the, here's one that makes me think of, of the, <coughs> the pacing that you talked about. Remember the little um, essay that she wrote about the geese flying overhead? Yes. Mm -hmm. in Vassar, and she's, you know the musical Times term. Andromeda. Times Andromeda. Yeah. Some of them are hanging back a little. It's like a rubato in music. Yeah. And then she describes the whole migration as kind of having an invisible net around it. And that always seems to me the kind of rhyme, the kind of dappled rhyme and the pacing that she's after in her poems. But this, this, this I think, is fascinating. The other day, and it speaks to what you said, before I realized it, the other day, before I realized it, I saw a man winding a barber pole. The iron <laughs> poles in the city must be electric, but this one wasn't. A large keyhole just below the striped section, and he wound it, sounded like a clock. The pole was striking up slowly, the stripes mounting with effort, gradually faster and faster. Mm. Fantastic. Yeah. So we come back to the power of her accurate eye. I mean, there's no questioning of that. I mean, yeah. it's absolutely there. Um, but in the pacing, the way she's yeah. written it, she gives you how she took it in. I just yeah. love yeah. that. Yeah. There's, there's a little moment she, in, in, in one of the letters that she's writing to Ann Stevenson. You know, Bishop was so kind of famously reticent about her personal life. And but here was this young American poet living in England, writing a book about her and asking her all sorts of questions. And she actually responds to these questions. And she kind of provides, and it's really great information for all of us who are interested in her. She provides so much personal detail. But there's, there is this one absolutely chilling moment in this letter to Ann Stevenson. She gets to 1934. Mm -hmm. And this is her whole comment about 1934. Met M.M., Marianne Moore. Met M.M., mother died, graduated. <laughs> yeah. It's like the, on the front of her notebook from the year she was consultant to the Library of Congress, a poetry consultant, on the front of the notebook, it says, 1950, just about my worst comma so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe this is a good moment. I don't know if uh, we have time to read a poem or two. Sure. But um, the poem that I had thought I might uh, read to the group today is a poem called The Bite. Since we're talking about Bishop's um, diary entries and so on. Uh, the Bite is, a, a, I think, a relevant poem. It's a, about a, a, a bite, B-I-G-H-T, is a, a, a kind of landscape uh, structure in uh, Florida. The Key West Bite is a kind of in, uh, enclosing of water. It's kind of like a bay. It's a little small enclosure. Um, but of course, it's also a pun. Uh, the bite, um, but uh, the right underneath the title of the po of the poem, the bite, we have uh, rather uncharacteristically, I think, on my birthday, and it's a descriptive poem. There's nothing about her birthday in the rest of the poem, but uh, anyone who knows Bishop will know that um, she wrote a letter to Robert Lowell while she was in Key West. Um, and said, the water at, uh, at the Key West Bight looks like blue glass. So, sorry, blue gas, uh, G-A-S. The, the water at, uh, at the Bight looks like blue gas. The harbor is always a mess here. Junky little boats all piled up, some hung with sponges, and always a few half sunk or splintered up from the most recent hurricane. 
it reminds me a little of my desk. So, uh, so you have to keep that in mind as you listen to this descriptive poem of, of the bite. Um, and there's so many things I love about this poem. Certainly the way that uh, this uh, kind of scanning of the surface of, of the scene um, leads to this um, more inward kind of reflection eventually. I love that about it. But I also love just, uh, as Alice suggested, Bishop loved names of things and she loved uh, she was quite the fisherwoman, uh, or fisherman, and so she loved nautical vocabulary. So there are great words like jack straw gaffs, and you know things that if you're not a boat person, you have to go and, and look up. And um, so there's that marvelous sense of vocabulary, and it's it's also a, a marvelous poem because it is on the one hand frightening in places, uh, close to even suicidal kinds of imagery, but it's also very funny. Um, and, and, and so there's this pulling back from um, something that's quite dark. Um, there is this vividness of the, of the, of the, of the scene. At the, the same time, there's a kind of dreamlike quality to the poem. So I'll just read it. Um, At low tide like this, how sheer the water is. White, crumbling ribs of marl, protrude and glare, and the boats are dry, the pilings dry as matches. Absorbing rather than being absorbed, the water in the bite doesn't wet anything. The color of the gas flame turned as low as possible. One can smell it turning to gas. So we could be in a Sylvia Plath poem at mm -hmm. this point, right? Mm -hmm. um, if one were Baudelaire, one would probably hear it turning to marimba music. <laughs> so there's this swerve, right? The, um, uh, um, the little ochre dredge at work off the end of the dock already plays the dry, perfectly offbeat claves. The birds are outsize. And here comes the comic part, and I think it's sort of self-parodic. <laughs> Pelicans crash into this peculiar gas unnecessarily hard, it seems to me, like pickaxes, rarely coming up with anything to show for it, and going off with enormous elbowings. Black and white man-o-war birds soar on impalpable drafts and open their tails like, like scissors on the curves of, uh, or tents, or, or sorry, um, and palpable drafts and open their tails like scissors on the curves or tense them like wishbones till they tremble. The frowsy sponge boats keep coming in with the obliging air of retrievers, bristling with jack straw gaffs and hooks and decorated with baubles of sponges. There is a fence of chicken wire along the dock where, glinting like little plowshares, the blue-gray shark tails are hung up to dry for the Chinese restaurant trade. Some of the little white boats are still s piled up against each other or lie on their sides, stove in, and not yet salvaged, if they ever will be, from the last bad storm, like torn open, unanswered letters. The bite is littered with old correspondences. Click, click, goes the dredge and brings up a dripping jaw full of marl. And all the untidy activity continues. Awful, but cheerful. <laughs> and I love uh, Bishop's gift for bringing important information into a poem through simile, the unobtrusive mode that allows the world to be the world while the poet en introduces her own thoughts. So the, the crucial information here of the, uh, the unopened uh, letters, torn open, uh, torn open unanswered letters, and um, the uh, allusions there to correspondences, not only interpersonal, but she was a great reader at this time of the poet Baudelaire who had a poem called Correspondence. And so she's introducing uh, a conversation with Baudelaire about the nature of the symbol, uh, but in this most subtle and, and, um, and delicate way. The last line, by the way, um, and I, I, maybe one of my colleagues here can tell the story of how this happened, but the last line 
All the untidy activity continues awful, but cheerful is engraved in her tombstone. Mm -hmm. So it, uh, it continues. You know, I just wanted to say that in, in rereading her poems for today, uh, one of the things that impressed me the most was the incredibly remarkable balance of tension between words that we could call happy yeah. <laughs> and words that we could call scary. Right. Or grim. Grim, yeah. mm -hmm. yes. And, and, and this is an excellent example of it. It's usually done in imagery, right. in descriptors, but here the last line, awful and cheerful, right. you know, brings it up almost to a level of abstraction. Exactly. Uh, that, that tension that is always there in the poems. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You know, when you were talking about her, um, when we brought up her, her love of naming things, I really feel that was imprinted early on with her love of Hopkins, Pied Beauty, mm -hmm. and all trades, their gear and tackle and trim. Yes, yes. You know, she, and the sounds yeah. uh, of this poem is just full of fabulous sounds, a mix of the Anglo, I mean, the word, the bite itself has that kind of wonderful Anglo-Saxon uh, well, I was going to say, it's... Am I interrupting? No. I was going to say that we talk about her eyes so much, and everyone does, but her ears, mm -hmm. not so bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she really is living in sound the whole time, I think. Don't you? Yeah. Right. And in this poem, sound and sight slip together. We have that synesthesia mm -hmm. where the blue gas turns to marimba music. <laughs> That's right. That's wonderful. Yeah. 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 Um. I, By the way, Lloyd has reprinted in the Library of America edition the entire correspondence with Anne Stevenson, which is really like a primer for her. Yeah, it's just one of the few places where she is actually talking about mm -hmm. about her life, and even in the in that extraordinary correspondence with Robert Lowell, that you know, seven hundred page correspondence that reads like a you know Victorian novel it's so gripping uh, but she doesn't really talk about talk very much about her personal history yeah. her background and they're really talking about more immediate things absolutely riveting and heartbreaking mm -hmm. but it is that one place where I think she yeah. was really she was concerned enough to have, a, you know, that after being, you know, she'd won some prizes and she was being published in The New Yorker, you know, she had a career, but she was also living in Brazil. And I think this was, she was just vulnerable enough to be willing to answer Anne Stevenson's mm. questions. Yeah, and also she Talk said, you know, everything. she sometimes wrote as many as 40 letters a day. And she described that as uh, sort of working without really working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, just, just let, me, let me just say, you know, for people who may not know the biographical data, um, Elizabeth Bishop had the most dramatically tragic early childhood. Uh, her, her father died when she was eight months old. Her mother, I don't know what the story is there about her, her mother's mental illness, but she was hospitalized and institutionalized when Elizabeth herself was five, five. correct? Yeah. And then she went to live with grandparents, and I think there was some shuffling back and forth between the sets of yeah. grandparents. Was there a custody battle also? No. no. But, but, but the parents on the father's side, they... Uh, they eventually understood that it was, she, she got asthma there, and she, she well, said that she felt about on the same level as the dog Be Be Beppo. Beppo. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> well, she was living with her maternal grandparents yes. in Nova Scotia, in a small town in Nova Scotia, and really enjoying herself as a kid. Yeah. And um, her maternal grandparents were not at all wealthy. I mean, just maybe barely lower middle class. He was but, a tanner. Yeah, yeah, right. Working family and uh, living in this little cottage uh, in a small town in Nova Scotia. Bishop's father's family were wealthy people from Worcester. Uh, Bishop's paternal grandfather 
owned a uh, uh, construction, construction company that, who built, you know, the Boston Public Library, mm -hmm. Symphony Hall. I mean, they were really yep. major, not architects, but but builders. Builders, and the the grandparents felt that you know their granddaughter living in this kind of practically on a farm running around the streets of uh, uh, of uh, great village the ironic name of the city <laughs> great Vi great village uh, <laughs> running around barefoot and bringing cows out into the meadow and playing tricks this was not what their granddaughter ought to be brought up to be and they essentially they didn't exactly abduct her, but they came, it was an, ag an agreement, and they brought Elizabeth to Worcester, where she was absolutely miserable. And as Alice said, developed asthma, developed eczema that never, let, the, the as, she almost died of asthma a number of times over her whole life. Mm. The eczema never was, completely cured, it was always recurring. And, and finally, the grandparents kind of had to admit that they had really made a mistake and kind of farmed Elizabeth out to her... To the aunt, is that when she her goes to aunt, the aunt? Her mother's sister who was living in Revere, Massachusetts, one of the suburbs, and then they paid for she went to the Walnut Hill School and then to Vassar, so they certainly paid for an absolutely first-rate education, but at a, at a great cost uh, to Bishop. And one she of She was so sick when she first got there, they had to carry her up the stairs. Yeah. And she didn't go to school until she was 15 right. or something like yeah. that. And that's her aunt got, got her Longfellow and Wordsworth and Blake and yes, Hopkins, and she th entered those poems. And, and one little detail about her mother being institutionalized was that Elizabeth was not allowed to ever visit her mother. And in you know they thought this was what psychiatry was in 1918 that it would be too upsetting uh, to Elizabeth's mother to see her daughter. So she was absolutely forbidden to see her. So once her mother was you know taken away and institutionalized, Bishop never saw her again. So, you know, that yeah. met M.M., well, suddenly yes. she has this new sort of surrogate mother in Marion Moore. Yeah. Met M.M., mother, mother died, died, graduated. graduated. Yeah. You know, that... that right. Well, there's the awful cheerful again. Awful Exactly. Cheerful. Yeah. And for those in the audience who are not yeah. terribly familiar with Bishop, there are some beautiful poems in which she explores her childhood, very famously, the poem Sestina, uh, the poem In the Waiting Room. Uh, she's a great poet of childhood and memory. Um, she's also a great poet of travel and landscape, yeah. and, um, and sometimes those things to come, come together. But, uh, but I think all this terrible, terrible suffering, um, not that it's a uh, consolation, but for us it's a gift that she was able to transform it into something very beautiful. Uh, some of the best poems of bishops, I think, are about childhood and memory. I was I I, I wanted to read a poem oh, also, good. but that goes that com goes a little later, and I mean, this isn't a childhood poem, but it's a poem about Brazil, and Brazil, she 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 never intended to stay in Brazil, but on her first visit, she got very sick. She was going to travel around Cape Horn on a Norwegian freighter. And she got as far as Brazil, and she was visiting. The boat was docking for a couple of weeks. And she was going to visit these two acquaintances of hers that whom she'd met in New York, a Brazilian woman and her American partner. Uh, and she, this, and this was 
connected to the asthma and the, mm -hmm. and the eczema, mm -hmm. she ate a piece of cashew fruit, the fruit that the nuts are, cashew nuts are in, and had a violent, you know, allergic reaction, anaphylactic shock, mm -hmm. and had to be hospitalized, and she blew up, she couldn't breathe, her, th her throat was constricted. She missed the boat. And fell in love with the Brazilian woman. And the Brazilian woman, Lada de Macedo Soares, came from a, an aristocratic family, had some money, said, stay, I'll build you a studio, mm -hmm. uh, and come to my home, you know, recuperate in this magnificent home in the, in the mountains. And that was, it, it really kind of saved her life right after she had that miserable year as, as a consultant in, in poetry yeah, to the Library of Congress, uh, the, what, the old name for Poet Laureate. And she really, for many years, she had a really great life in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And then things, be, for various complicated reasons, including political, and her, the, the commitments of Lada to public works, and she was building a park in Rio. It's the most beautiful park in Rio now, but it, it essentially it killed her. And uh, the relationship began to deteriorate, and Bishop left, Bishop left Brazil. And, um, and it's a sort of tragic story. Are you going to read Arrival? I'm going to read Pink Dawn. Oh, oh good. Which is a poem that she started when she started on the verge of leaving Brazil. I think the original title of this poem was Farewell to Rio. And then she changed the title to Pink Dog. It took her 20 years to finish it, and it was actually, it was the very, it wasn't the last poem she started. I hope Jean is going to read the last poem she started, Sonnet. Oh, I am. Uh, but it's the but last. But it was published in the last year. It's of the her last life. poem she finished. It was actually the last I'm poem sorry. that that she succeeded in finishing, and it, it, it just. I wanted to read it because it, it says some. It, it's such a wonderful example of the things that Bonnie was talking about before: the the, the images of of the city, and then the awful but cheerful in a kind of extreme because there's a really bitter joke yeah. in, mm. in the poem. And then the sound effects, where she's actually imitating the sound of a samba. And I think it's my theory that this is her parody of the girl from Ipanema. Mm. <laughs> that, and, and really, you can almost you can almost sing this to the music of the girl from Ipanema. When, when did that song get published? Well, that was in the 60s, yeah. and it was written by a close friend of hers, yeah. Venetius de Moraes, who was a very oh. famous poet and actor. And she translated him? Ladies, oh. ladies man. So she, she translated him. But we have to say, her translation of Venetius's sonnet of intimacy, Bishop was so proud of it. You know, people have this image of her as this very prim, you know, <laughs> Miss Bishop. People called her Miss Bishop. That translation had the word, ended with the word piss. And it was the first time a four-letter word had ever appeared in, in a poem Yorker. in The New Yorker. <laughs> and Bishop was so proud of this. I mean, she really bragged about it. it is. Uh, but this, let me read this poem. I think, it's, I think it's one of her most amazing poems. Pink Dog, Rio de Janeiro. And remember, in The Girl from Ipanema begins with this beautiful Brazilian woman in a bikini crossing the, the Avenida Atlantica to go to the beach. Uh, pink dog. The sun is blazing and the sky is blue. Umbrellas clothe the beach in every hue. Naked, 
you trot across the avenue. Oh, never have I seen a dog so bare, naked and pink, without a single hair. Startled, the passers-by draw back and stare. Of course, they're mortally afraid of rabies. You are not mad. You have a case of scabies, but look intelligent. Where are your babies? A nursing mother by those hanging teats. In what slum have you hidden them, poor bitch, while you go begging, living by your wits? Didn't you know it's been in all the papers to solve this problem, how they deal with beggars? They take and throw them in the tidal rivers. Yes, idiots, paralytics, parasites go bobbing in the ebbing sewage, nights out in the suburbs where there are no lights. If they do this to anyone who begs, drugged, drunk, or sober, with or without legs, what would they do to sick, four-legged dogs? In the cafes and on the sidewalk corners, the joke is going round that all the beggars who can afford them now wear life preservers. In your condition, you would not be able even to float much less to dog paddle. Now look, the practical, the sensible solution is to wear a fantasia. Tonight, you simply can't afford to be a nysore, <laughs> but no one will ever see a dog in mascara this time of year. Ash Wednesday will come, but carnival is here. What sambas can you dance? What will you wear? They say that carnival's degenerating. Radios, Americans, or something have ruined it completely. <laughs> They're just talking. Carnival is always wonderful. A depilated dog would not look well. Dress up. Dress up and dance at carnival. <laughs> She actually breaks the line in the middle of the word an, A-N. <laughs> you simply can't afford to be a nysore. <laughs> the N is on the beginning of the next line. It's like Glenn's Falls. Yeah, Glenn's right. Falls. Yeah. <laughs> so should, should we read Song for the Rainy Season? Oh, yes. Which um, kind of describes her almost in, in anticipation of the, the end of the paradisical time in, right. in Brazil. Um, That's a poem I wish were a lot better known. I think it's oh, a wonderful God. poem. She talked about um, pacing by the little um, spring uh, by their home, and the, the maid would be, uh, she, she said, what, what, what must she think of me as I go back repeating phrases over and over? <laughs> and I can't help thinking, how did she feel when she came up with hidden, oh, hidden in the high fog, the house we live in? <laughs> Song for the rainy season. Hidden, oh, hidden in the high fog, the house we live in, beneath the magnetic rock. Rain, rainbow ridden, where blood black bromelias, lichens, owls, and the lint of the waterfalls cling, familiar, unbidden. In a dim age of water, the brook sings loud from a rib cage of giant fern. Vapor climbs up the thick growth effort effortlessly, turns back, holding them both house and rock in a private cloud. At night on the roof, blind drops crawl, and the ordinary brown owl gives us proof he can count. Five times, always five, he stamps and takes off after the fat frogs that shrilling for love clamor and mount. House, open house to the white dew and the milk-white sunrise kind to the eyes. To membership of silverfish, mouse, bookworms, big moths with a wall for the mildew's ignorant map. Darkened and tarnished by the warm touch of the warm breath Immaculate, cherished, rejoice. 
for a later era will differ, O oh, difference that kills or intimidates much of all our small shadowy life. Without water, the great rock will stare unmagnetized, bare, no longer wearing rainbows or rain, the forgiving air and the high fog gone. The owls will move on and the several waterfalls shrivel in the steady sun. Oof. She saw it coming. <laughs> I mean, it's so, you, you're, that wonderful mm. description of how, of just this open, how the, it was a modern house with glass walls and, you know, it was just, you almost couldn't tell where the house ended and the, mm. and the, you know, rainforest. Yeah, began. she had that wonderful description uh, in a letter saying, it's, it's all part of the really lofty vagueness of Brazil, <laughs> where a cloud is entering my living room right this minute. <laughs> right. <laughs> One of the things that that poem brings out, and actually all the poems we've read bring out, it brings out is uh, how often uh, her poems engage animal life. Mm. And uh, uh, I mean, in the case of Pink Dog, in a most sort of uh, parable way. I mean, yeah. Pink She's Dog really is She's identifying. A, of course, yeah, Pink creatures. Dog is, 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 is sort of an allegorical mm. figure there. But, but there's a continuum, I think, then all the animals in Bishop are, both they're, they're, they're figures from a kind of the unconscious life of, of the world, but they're also surrogates for the poet, her way in to, to get closer to that unconscious life of the world. Yeah. And so she's a great poet of animals and encounters with animals in a way very different from other poets, Marianne Moore, for instance, where there is much more the sense of, of writing fables in the Aesop tradition um, or else scientific uh, uh, tracts, even you know, which uh, feature articles on animals. Uh, Bishop's animals have this this wonderful otherness and yet communication with the human world, or, or resonance with the human world, and yeah. the owls and so on in that scene. I think bring that out really, really well. Yeah, and she loved the number five. Always five. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, uh, which reminds me, just a. Uh, 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 back to that thing about her vision and what a curse as well as what a blessing is in a in a in a prose poem called Rainy Season Subtropics. There's a section called Giant Toad, which begins mm. uh, well close at the near the beginning. My eyes bulge and hurt. They are my one great beauty. Even mm. so. They see too much above, below, and yet there is not much to see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are extraordinary. I love yeah. those. Uh -huh. Oh, Jean. <laughs> well, Would I was just thinking, I don't know if this is obvious, but I just say it in case it isn't, uh, that it seems to me that the eye, the, the everything she saw all around her, probably from when she was born, was a way of connecting uh, and, and locating herself in the world. And I think her rhymes were like that, too. I was thinking before we came today that I, I don't really have anything to say about her rhymes except that. But it seemed to me they were comforting to her, as they are to us as readers. Uh, rhyme always is, I think. It's, it's either very emphatic only or comforting. Mm -hmm. But um, she has, I, I was first reading her when I was very young, luckily, uh, had her North and South and a Cold Spring in my raincoat pocket when I was mm -hmm. in college because somebody told me, read Miss Bishop. We called everybody that then, I mean all the women, Miss Moore. You know. <laughs> It was ridiculous. But anyway, uh, I did have that book, and I would be so struck by her rhymes, because I wasn't sure in 1956 if you should rhyme or not. Uh, who mm -hmm. knew? Anyway, nobody could tell you. But she was rhyming uh, almost, it seemed, without effort. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's how yeah. all great poets do. But uh, in a wonderful, fluid way. I mean, have my way. back to you. Excuse me? In a wonderfully fluid way, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think of the fantastic use of rhyme in something like the moose yeah. where you know it, it's not a rhyme scheme no. 
but often she's rhyming words of nature and words and human world words so mm -hmm. um, you know mm -hmm. birches and churches yes so that there's this beautiful integration mm -hmm. that can happen in the place yeah. of rhyme uh, yeah. master and disaster yes well, she stole that one from W.H. Auden but, <laughs> but you know when you say that um, reminded me of something now I can't think what um, oh I know what it was but I have a friend who's very, very good at writing formal verse, Joan Larkin. And she has said that, and this probably gave me the idea of this thing of seeing and, and hearing, too. Uh, Joan said she does a crown of so sonnets about some painful subject. And she said it's like a handhold through the pain uh, for her lovely. to have the rhyme yeah. scheme, very tight rhyme scheme in that case. But I think by the time of the moose, she probably didn't even have to think about it. Oh, no. You know, it was yeah. so probably in her body by then. I'm mm -hmm. sure she did think about it, but you know. Uh, yeah. She said to a friend of mine, I'm going to stop in a minute, but no, no, she no, said to a friend of mine, so. uh, Eleanor Ross Taylor, a very wonderful poet that you know, Alice. Alice, I mean, excuse me, uh, Elizabeth had just done reading, and so Eleanor, a poet too, came up to her and said, I just love that poem, The Moose. It's just, I don't, it's just a miraculous poem, because we all feel that. But um, Elizabeth, I think this is characteristic, from what I know, said, it's just what happened. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's a very telling thing, as well as a sort of fun anecdote, I think, of her modesty, but right. I think, I think she liked what happened, right? yeah, yeah. as well as, of course, the pain. Yeah. But I think it gave her her life. Yeah, I it do was think the Harvard so. Don't you? Phi Beta Kappa poem, and oh. she heard oh, somebody yeah. <laughs> saying afterwards, "Not bad for a poem." For right. poem. For poem. <laughs> <laughs> also, it was introduced by the uh, provost or whoever was in charge of that reading as Elizabeth Bishop will now read her new poem, The Moose. The Moose, right. <laughs> she got a lot of mileage out of, out of that, too. But I was thinking, hearing you talk about, about, because I'm hoping you will read Sonnet. I want to. Because the rhymes are so intricate, and they're often N not all the rhymes are at the ends of the words, but they're kind of buried in the middles mm. of, in the middle of uh, the ends of lines, but buried in the middles of lines. And there's so much play. If I think if you just heard the poem, you couldn't actually tell where the lines mm. were supposed to mm. end because they're so playful and tricky. I think poem. that's so beautiful, and I think that's how she got to be, don't you? I mean, you knew her, so but it feels to me like she just did it all her life, and that's how she got to be. Do you think? Yeah. But she just, yeah. I yeah. don't know, sonnet. And well, I'll read it. Caught the bubble in the spirit level, a creature divided, and the compass needle wobbling and wavering, undecided. Freed the broken thermometer's mercury running away, and the rainbow bird from the narrow bevel of the empty mirror flying wherever it feels like gay. So beautiful. That was the poem that ran in the New Yorker after Bishop died, mm -hmm. and there was some conversation between Alice Meth Fessel and Howard because uh, Bishop had corrected that poem uh, by phone, and, 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 and the yeah. manuscript, as it, as it was in galley in the New Yorker, said, caught the bubble in the spirit level, contrarily guided, <laughs> not a creature divided, and then she changed it. Mm -hmm. But Howard had to testify yeah. to that, really. <laughs> Such a good and, change. And oh. mirrors were very important yeah. to Bishop. Yeah. And um, in, in her early notebook, she had this wonderful entry, age 23. A woman sat, um, let me see, oh, her wicked mirror took her face, crumpled it quickly, and flung it back. Mm. <laughs> oh, no. And she loved inversions. Yeah. Um, I mean, you were, we were talking about rhyme, and of course, as, as you well know, 
um, sonnet is an upside down sonnet. It's not only a very yeah. narrow sonnet, it's right, it's two eight beats eight instead of the full uh, iambic and pentameter, so, yeah. but it's, 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 it's uh, yeah, <laughs> it's not eight and six in the traditional sonnet form, but, but it's the upside down um, mm. six and eight, so. Uh, She's playing with inversion in all kinds of ways, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. and yet it never feels contrived. I think that's what you were saying yeah, about the, yeah. the kind of, it just seems to emerge. Uh -huh. It just yeah. seems to happen. Isn't there an image in one of the poems that takes place in Brazil in which the person has to find a mirror that's never been looked into? Yes, that's the river man. Right. Yeah. Oh, right. the river man, that's right. Yeah, yeah that's it. Imagines herself as, as a, um, a shaman type figure. Yes. Yeah. There's That's also a poem called, an earlier poem called Insomnia, about mm. the moon in the bureau mirror and looking into the mirror as a, as a, a, a world inverted. Even the phrase mm. is inverted. Mm. Um, where day is always night, and I yeah. forget what the list of things is, and the last line in this inverted world is, and you love me. Oh, oh that's true. Then those were yeah. the only poems that she sort of openly said, it's about a love affair, about a failed love affair. Right. The beautiful poem, Conversation, yeah, right. until a name and all its connotation mean the oh, same. Yeah. It's just so beautiful. So beautiful. Um, well, I'd kind of like to recite Sandpiper. Good. Her self-portrait, thinking about all of her travels, and that, and that fat pan, that fat sputtering mm. in the pan. Um, I, so the only reference, I think, is to Blake, to see the world in a grain of sand and eternity in an hour. Uh, so Sandpiper, the roaring alongside he takes for granted, and that every so often the world is bound to shake. He runs, he runs to the south, finical, awkward, in a state of controlled panic, a student of Blake. The beach hisses like fat on his left, an interrupting sheet of water, a sheet of interrupting water, comes and goes and glazes over his dark and brittle feet. He runs, he runs straight through it, watching his toes, watching rather the spaces of sand between them where no detail too small. The Atlantic drains backwards and downwards. As he runs, he stares at the dragging grains. The world is a mist, and then the world is minute and vast and clear. The tide is higher or lower, he couldn't tell you which. His beak is focused, he is preoccupied, looking for something, something, something. Poor bird, he is obsessed. The millions of grains are black, white, tan and brown mixed with quartz grains, rose, and amethyst. Gray, not brown. Mm -hmm. Black, white, tan, and gray mixed with quartz. I love that poem so much. That's so beautiful. Speak is focused, he is preoccupied. Thank is, you. Um, Elliot Carter, the late Elliot Carter, who recently died at mm -hmm. almost 104, yeah. <laughs> still writing, wow. yeah. um, wrote a song cycle uh, based on Elizabeth Bishop poems, and Sandpiper is, is in that cycle. And he knew that that was an autobiographical poem. Mm. And so the Sandpiper in his setting is, um, is played by an oboe, which mm. was Carter's own instrument. Oh. So he was mirroring her autobiogra autobiography in his autobi autobiography cool. oh. and searching for something, something, something. Mm. The world is minute and vast, both, yeah. which is so, it seems very yeah. bishop. The shift in scale that we're always talking yeah. about. That's yeah. so, it's so vibrant when a poet does that. Yeah. She, didn't, she didn't like the setting. <laughs> she didn't like Carter's setting. Yeah. She didn't get it. Yeah. The other thing about the, the Sandpiper um, and Insomnia and many of her poems is that she had this conversation with the tradition of poetry. Um, she was deeply read but not uh, at all showy about her, her reading. Uh, not a poet that uh, requires footnotes. She didn't like footnotes. Uh, but there's, there are conversations going on with poetry of the past 
um, not for the purpose of displaying erudition yeah. or uh, uh, you know a particular narrow uh, kind of mastery, but just because the, the conversation, one of the things poetry is for is to conduct a conversation over time. And so Insomnia has a conversation with Sir Philip Sidney's famous poem, Addressed to the Moon, and of course mm. Blake's Auguries of Innocence in, yeah. um, in the Sandpiper. And, um, she quotes a Herbert line in Waiting at Wellfleet, yes. although mm. she doesn't say who she's quoting. And it doesn't matter if you don't know. It, right. The poem is, completely, is complete by yeah. itself right. without that knowledge, but there's this uh, layer that is pleasing to those of us who do know the poems yeah. of the past, and, and it just reminds us that, that poetry exists in those two dimensions of the yeah. contemporaneity and the long vertical um, tradition feeling of, yeah. of, of the tradition. Speaking of Herbert, do you all know the Herbert dream she had? You all do. I, uh, she, she dreamed uh, that Herbert appeared to her in, his, in her dream and with his curls and his scarlet <laughs> uh, shirt, I'll say. Uh, and he said to her, I can help you. <laughs> Isn't that nice? 17th yeah. century priest. Right? I wish I'd get yeah. one like that. <laughs> yeah. and, and he, but I do believe he did. He did. You know, yes. he really did. After, after Lotta died, she carried Herbert with her yeah. for and weeks. Even in, in camp when she was a little girl, yeah. I think she had her. Yeah. We're talking about George Herbert, the Excuse great me. Yeah. 17th century poet. I think I, I didn't say that. And it, it reminds me, too, that something that we haven't mentioned, I don't think, but which appears also in many of her poems, uh, sort of not too obviously, is the architecture of the church, mm. uh, or maybe a personage of the church. Mm. Uh, she doesn't make a big point about it, but when she's describing her landscapes, there's a spire. Right. Uh, she's qualifying the whether bird it's cage a... cage like the Jesuit church. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, she does. So Do you know that house? Oh, excuse me. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. The house in uh, Great Village in Nova Scotia is right next to the church, mm. and she had an amazing, which with quite a high spire for Great Village, mm -hmm. and uh, she had an amazing thing that she says somewhere, and I don't remember where, but if you touched your, this is after her mother had had the scream, the, she wrote a beautiful story. Wasn't it a story called yeah. The Scream about the- in, in the village. In the village, in the village it's called. And yeah, the low poem was called The Scream, right. I think. Anyway, it's about a moment of breakdown of her mother when she's being fitted for a dress. And it's a beautiful, beautiful story if you get the chance to read it. I think the first um, words in the story are The Scream. The Scream, maybe yeah. that's it, oh, yeah. okay. Well, I think it's in there that she talks about the church mm -hmm. steeple, and if you put your finger on the church steeple, it would be the scream. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Yeah, that is, that yeah. is the image. It is the image. It would be yeah. like a tuning. Like a yeah, it would make the scream. But when you mentioned the church, she was right next to that church for those years, you know. She has the Baptist hymns to the seal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, a lot well, of you can hear also uh, some of her poetry has the, the cadence Dicto. of Dickinson, who got her exactly. cadences from the hymns, and yeah. you can see that, that yeah, carryover uh, yes. as well. Yeah. But there is this sort of quiet it's compass, quiet. you know, where the church is being found in the landscape mm -hmm. in many poems, I think, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. comes up that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ambivalently, sometimes, yes. <laughs> of course. Catholicism, I think she had her reservations about. Yeah, the, the, the gold in the Vatican yeah. made her sick. Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, I think that there, I was looking through the early notebooks to see if I could share some things, and I think that one of the things that about Bishop's poems, there's always, she has a good sense of drama. Mm -hmm. And oh, you know, yes. that's where the mystery comes in. Mm -hmm. And there was this little fr tiny fragment. Again, she's 24 years old here in New York, 1934. When we walked across the bridge, the sun particularized certain windows off the river. Mm -hmm. If you should go to such a place at such a time, burst in and say, <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's great. Amazing. Yeah. And that's what she took from seeing that window. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful. Oh. Really? These notebooks are great. 
Does, did she? She never tried to write a play, did she? No, I mean, she read a lot of plays in the she, public library. When there's a lot of she, dialogue in her poems built she, in. She was. She did translate the birds. Yeah, the masks. That's right, of course. Yeah. Yes. And she, Elizabethan right, right. masks, she, Dryden and such, she mm -hmm. was reading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, in but her youth. but she never tried to write a, no. an original play. No, she wrote That's everything right. else. I think. Yes, yeah. didn't she? <laughs> mm. And she loved, loved, loved witty people. Wit mm -hmm. was very important to her. Mm -hmm. And I think she said that Pauline Hemingway was the wittiest person that she had ever known. But um, she, in one of the letters, or maybe to Anne Stevenson, I think, she mm -hmm. said, I've, mm -hmm. I've been lucky in my life. I've known some very, very witty people. And what the, um, what's the line in, in, in One Art, at the end of One Art? The, the joking the voice. voice. Oh, the gesture. The, the, the mm -hmm. gesture mm -hmm. I love, but the yeah. joking, joking voice, voice yeah. so important. Mm -hmm. And that the, 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 mm -hmm. the, 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 you know, the two most serious relationships that she had, most, I said most serious is the wrong word, mm -hmm. but the two really biggest, deepest relationships that she had were with, with, with people who were very witty mm -hmm. and entertained her. Lotta, uh, allegedly, I mean, I never knew Lotta, mm -hmm. but Alice Medfessel, who was, mm -hmm. you know, very funny, very amusing person, no nonsense. Yeah. Really, not very interested in poetry, but who who could make Elizabeth laugh? That's great. Um, there was a uh, there's a little visual um, anecdote that Bishop wrote in her notebooks, and it's about her friend Margaret Miller, who she <laughs> loved very deeply in school mm. and college, and uh, Margaret ended up at the Museum of Modern Art as a curator and. Uh, uh, I think one of the authors was Schwitter's catalog. Yes. Very, oh, yes. Very, anyway, the, this is, uh, Margaret leaned out of the car um, with a comb in her hand and pretended to comb the round chromium dome of the spotlight. <laughs> then she tied a scarf around its head. <laughs> you just, you see that she was so, it's like fun to play. You mentioned Sch Schwitter's. And Schwitters and Paul Clay, who are mm. two of the wittiest artists, were also two of her favorite yeah, yeah, artists. Yeah. She loved Clay, yeah. yeah. Well, I uh, mean, Bishop didn't write a, a vast amount of poetry. The collected Bishop isn't, isn't that big. Well, it's bigger now than it was before. <laughs> but I mean, yeah. what she allowed to be published right. wasn't very much. But um, as some of you may know, she was a great letter writer. I think you already mentioned. Uh, and her sense of humor in the letters is just fantastic. Yeah. Um, I, I remember think they'll be like Byron's later on. They'll publish mm -hmm. them in 13 volumes mm -hmm. or something. Uh, she'd, she'd see, um, uh, there's a wonderful description in Key West of um, uh, two pelicans on a, um, some kind of a boardwalk or something. And uh, a blowfish. They'd, 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 they'd swoop down and, and grabbed a blowfish, and one of them had swallowed it, and blowfish um, expand. So it started to expand inside the gullet of this pelican, and he spit it out, like a, she said, like a basketball to the other pelican. And so they started playing basketball with the, with the blowfish. And you know, Bishop's eye for that kind of the sense of the delightfully absurd. Yeah. I mean, in the poem The Bite, I think you see a lot of that, where the you know, the, the birds coming back with like the, like the like obliging retrievers, you know, yeah. and it's just, it's just very comic, a comic sense of life. That, yeah. is, um, she didn't like appearing in public, and she didn't enjoy giving readings, and she made a number of recordings, and there are a number of recordings, not many, there are a number of recordings of her, of her reading, and and they're not very good, and they certainly don't capture the quality of the poem or her quality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was a PBS series called Voices and Visions some years ago, a few decades ago now, and the producers of the series actually got the actress Blythe Danner to read her poems because they couldn't stand the way Bishop read. I think it was a serious mistake. You wanted to hear Bishop's voice and 
Blythe Danner, I hope she's not here today, <laughs> didn't, hadn't really worked on the poems very much. <laughs> but there is one recording, and it's on, uh, on J.D. McClatchy's, yeah. there's a, t uh, a tape, I, I don't know if it's on, I don't even know if it's on it's a, a CD, CD but, it's a tape. Yeah. but there's a tape of Bishop reading, and there's one reading, one poem that she reads, and it's a comic poem called Filling Station, mm -hmm. where she herself actually chuckles at one of the jokes. <laughs> and for me, it's the only recording of hers that actually sounds like the person I know. Yeah because she was so stiff as a reader, but her, just her little giggle. I, can I read Filling yeah, Station? Yeah, read it. it's, it's, this is a poem. There's a book called Questions of Travel. It's her third book. And it's divided into two parts. One part is called Brazil, and the second part is called Elsewhere. So, and the poem Filling Station is in the Elsewhere section. And I always assumed that it was the filling station across the street from her grandmother's house in Great Village. But in the letters to Ann Stevenson, she says it's in Brazil. Yeah. It's on this deserted road in, in Brazil. I mean, I, I, I just <laughs> discovered this myself. And, but I still think of it as oh, yeah. Great Village. <laughs> filling Station. Or, or yeah. Right. <laughs> filling station. Oh, but it is dirty, this little filling station. Oil soaked, oil permeated to a disturbing overall black translucency. Be careful with that match. <laughs> Father wears a dirty, oil soaked monkey suit that cuts him under the arms and several quick and saucy and greasy sons assist him. It's a family filling station, all quite thoroughly dirty. Do they live in the station? It's a question. Do they live in the station? Mm -hmm. It has a cement porch behind the pumps, and on it a set of crushed and grease-impregnated wicker work. On the wicker sofa, a dirty dog, quite comfy. Some comic books provide the only note of color, of certain color. They lie upon a big dim doily draping a tabaret, part of the set, behind a big hirsute begonia. <laughs> I think that's where she giggles. <laughs> Why the extraneous plant? Why the tabaret? Why, oh why, the doily? Mm -hmm. Embroidered in daisy stitch with marguerites, I think, and heavy <coughs> with gray crochet. Somebody embroidered the doily. Somebody waters the plant, or oils it, maybe. <laughs> Somebody arranges the rows of cans so that they softly say, Esso, so, 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 to high-strung automobiles. Somebody loves us all. That's so wonderful. She told me that so, so, so was what you said to horses. If you're in a, in a buggy and the horse gets upset, that this is what you say to calm the horses oh, yeah. down. So like when cars mm -hmm. started coming into these that's country true. towns. Animals. Yeah. And oh. that, that's what so the esso it's not just the joke oh. on esso but that yeah. is also this that's great to know. Isn't that so, nice? so you know, unfortunately we only have well, less than 10 minutes and I want to give people from the audience an opportunity to oh, yeah comment or ask questions. If anyone wants to say something, please come up to the microphone so we can get you Thanks on the for recording. That. I love Thank you very that. much. really wonderful and enlightening and informative. I knew her poetry and I didn't know anything really about her. Yeah. I mean, I've had this book forever. 
And um, my name is Merle Malofsky, by the way. And one thing I would like to add to the commentary on the, or wonder actually why it wasn't mentioned, was her social consciousness, particularly her Brazil poems, which, uh, well, like the Pink Dog, which is very powerful, but also, I'm not going to read it, I'm just going to read the titles, <laughs> Squatter's Children, and most profoundly, the one that moves me the most is The Burglar of Babylon. Mm. And I'm thinking of her generation and the poets who were socially conscious, like Muriel Ruckheiser, and our, every generation needs uh, poets to comment and remind us and consolidate our awareness. And I'm going to do a tiny plug, which is I'm going to be doing, I'm not, don't, you don't have to, you know, I'm not saying write this down, but I am going to be doing a uh, presentation at NYU in June that's sponsored by Cleo Psyche. It's their conference and I'll be part of a panel on psychoanalysis and poetry. And I think it's very important for psychoanalysts to recognize what poetry actually means in a world, uh, in an internet, instant access world, and to remember that the poets always spoke for an entire culture. So thank you for this. Thank you. Thank you. You know, there's, there's something that I thought this psychoanalytically oriented among us would be interested to hear. This is again from the early notebook. If I stretch my thought to Egypt, to India, downtown, it is in my thought I see them, and they are not at the time reality for me. If I go to these places, it's a different matter. Reality then is something like a huge circus tent folding, adjustable, which we carry around with us and set up wherever we are. It possesses the magical property of being able to take on the characteristics of whatever place we are in. In fact, it, it can become identical with it. Yeah. That's such an interesting yeah. circus tent, though. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hello, um, my name is James Simon, and I want to thank the speakers. And I also wanted to ask if we know anything about her process from the, her notebooks. Did she write in the morning? Did she write at night? Did she write every day? I hear that she wrote a lot of letters, but you know, how did, because she didn't write many poems that we know of. That's number one. And number two, McClatchy mentions that she was a chronic alcoholic. So I did that. Do you have any comments about that? Well, she wasn't an alcoholic, I don't think, to the extent, say, that Berryman, you know, people didn't worry about her the way they, I mean, they worried about her in her, in her, in her personal life, but not to step up to the microphone and completely lose it. Oh. But she, yeah, it's, I mean, it's particularly in her 40s in Key West, it was her well, friends was were terrified, antibuse. and she took antabuse right. in Brazil for that. Definitely, it was a huge part of her life, and I think if you, it's in the poetry, definitely. In the process, I mean, there's certainly been references to her waiting for decades to get a word for a poem. Isn't that true? Where you know yeah. she had the idea for a poem and she'd sort of leave a space. I think you know, and but and Lowell's poem about her. You uh, talks about the her. I wish I could quote it now. Yeah. Waiting decades for the for the perfect word. And, you who and make the casual perfect. perfect. Yeah. You, yeah, mm. right. There are manuscripts you can look at. Uh, for instance, at Harvard, there's a poem called Crusoe at Home. <laughs> you know, it's a, you know, it's a draft of, of, uh, of, of um, the later poem. There's many examples yeah. of her but yeah. reworking Crusoe things. Crusoe in England, the moose, pink dog, among her masterpieces are poems that took her decades to complete. But maybe her most famous poem, One Art, the Villanelle, and in this very complicated form, took her a week. And we have all the drafts, which Alice has uh, reprinted in Edgar Allan Poe in the Jukebox. Mm. They are amazing, because you see the first version is almost prose, and it's, a, it's all over the place. 
and she instantly figures out that it needs to be in a form. And she is desperate. She, this is a breakup of, of this relationship with Alice Methfessel, and, and she is on the verge of suicide and maybe has even, even makes a maybe half-hearted suicide attempt in the process. Mm -hmm. And that poem, working on that poem, I have absolute conviction, has kept her alive. Mm -hmm. and, and um, this is one art. one art. Another side of her, more comical maybe, side of her process as a young writer, and many young writers do this, um, uh, we mentioned that, uh, that Marianne Moore was very important to her. So, so not only uh, did they meet and become friends, but they, became, they developed a mentor-protege relationship, and she would send things to Marianne Moore. And Marianne Moore would kindly retype them with lots of changes. <laughs> and so at a certain point, Bishop decided to back off from that particular side of the writing process of showing Marianne Moore everything that she wrote. Because well, there's a, there's a notorious <laughs> story where uh, Bishop wrote maybe the most ambitious of her early poems called Roosters. It's in her first mm -hmm. book. And she a sent war poem. A war yeah. poem, yeah. And she sent it to Marion Moore. And it has those triple rhymes uh, as like Pink Dog. Mm -hmm. And she's doing something rather daring, almost right. writing a kind of nursery rhyme. But it's a very serious and very ambitious poem. And Marion Moore really didn't get what she was no. doing and didn't like the triple rhymes and also wanted her to change the title. To the cock. Right. <laughs> Not a good idea. Uh, Not a good idea. And good idea. Bishop, and let, me Bishop just, uh, that. let me just hold up for a second. I know that a couple of our participants had to like catch buses and things at 3:30. Oh, okay. You're okay? Okay. So we can go a little bit longer. Okay. We'll let people have their chance. Yeah, Thank you. you. Okay. Uh, I had an opportunity to look at and listen to the. Uh, PBS special, which is for anybody's information online, it's marvelous. Is it? Oh, I one hour, get it online. full it's hour, cool. no interruptions. Well, it's oh. great. So um, I learned a lot last night preparing to be an audience member and listening. I wanted to know a little bit more about the character of Friday. Apparently, it was a real person because at one point they made reference to the fact that she bemoaned the fact that he had passed away of the measles. So what do we know about this Friday person? <laughs> well, I, I've always taken that to be a kind of, again, it's, she's doing the Robinson Crusoe story, and Friday, of course, is the character in Robinson Crusoe. And I think it's her veiled reference to Lotta de Macedo Soares. Mm -hmm. um, that is, this was the, in her loneliness, this is the person who comes and rescues her. Mm -hmm. Is that the woman relationship yes, with the yes, woman? Yes, yeah. yes. And I mean, in, you know, in Crusoe in England, Crusoe is a man, Friday is a man. They talk about, oh, if only they could have had children. It, you know, it's not a. It's not exactly an allegory of you know one to one, but I think that's sort of. In, in my mind, that's sort of where mm. Friday comes in. And that it's really, and the poem ends with the death of Friday, and it's mm. so heartbreaking because yeah. I think that's who she's thinking of. And, mm. and Lotta probably committed suicide. Mm. And I want to push back it, just yeah. a little, though, because I, I tend to, uh, I, I think many poems come from personal experience, but I worry when we reduce poems to autobiography. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Crusoe story is one of the great archetypal stories of Western culture. And all of that is important. And mm -hmm. Friday represents the native. He represents the other world, the third world, as it was called then. And, uh, and he represents a, a relationship to uh, the landscape and to the place that Crusoe doesn't have. And that, that's universal. And so I worry when we, we always want to bring fiction back to fact, you know, that we miss really one of the great goals of poetry is to share this. Yeah, so. 
it's not to, to contradict anything that's been said, but just to open it up. But I think that's, that's probably where it comes from, but that we have to see it as, the, we have to see the story as the well, story. It's, 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 all, it's all those things, I think, you know. I think it makes kind of sense to think of her and, uh, it's just like in the moose, you know, I think there's an autobiographical element when she overhears the conversation about mm -hmm. the grandparents right. in eternity right. and mm -hmm. about someone who's a drinker, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. that's her way of bringing right. in that story. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, right. She's overhearing it. Right. <laughs> and that's a wonderful way of bringing in the drinking, I think, because I, I didn't want to understate the, yeah. the, the importance of that in her life. Yeah. It was a big project of Lada's to help her combat that problem. She was a very cheap drunk. So you mean it didn't she, take her much to get drunk? Right. <laughs> yeah. So uh -huh. she could, you know, and she knew this. But so if she had a, dr a drink, it wasn't going to stop there because she would immediately get drunk and then she would keep drinking and she would go on binges. Right. But in a way, the question about whether she was an alcoholic is... It, becomes more complicated because she wasn't always drunk. And there were just, there were, you know, long periods. Well, she was on ant abuse for a while, you know, here from time to time. But there were also periods when she just wasn't drinking mm -hmm. and where she was completely lucid and writing poems. And, you know, maybe <laughs> she would have written more poems if she didn't have these binges. And it was a drinking generation of writers. Yeah. They were all drinking. Yeah. Okay. Yes. How do you think she might have interacted or fared in a world like ours today with Facebook and talk shows and self-exposure? Do you think, um, and do you think that there could be an Elizabeth Bishop who fully interacts electronically today? <laughs> Oh, I hope, you know, I hope so, but I don't think she, I can't imagine Elizabeth on Facebook. She famously uh, said, closets, closets, and more closets. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. Um, well, but even just the, the disappearance of, or the erosion of the idea of territoriality and regionality because the internet mm -hmm. is connecting everybody, how do you yeah, think yeah. she might? That's what I was going to say is I have a poet friend who's a whiz on the whole thing uh, electronically. And I said, I don't really do much of it. And uh, she said, but Jean, you can talk to a poet anywhere in the world and you can read their poems anywhere on our little globe. You can, that must have fascinated Bishop if she had gotten that good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they could have read her. <laughs> well, now people in, in Ireland, you can't graduate from high school without uh, learning 10 poems of Elizabeth Bishop. I mean, oh, out really? of 100, I think. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the realm of uh, photography and, and documentary, I've sometimes had to talk to students. And when I wanted to point out uh, an artist who was um, to talk about the issue of sentimentality, I send them to um, Helen Levitt. And it occurred to me today, if you know Helen Levitt's work, that yes. there's something very akin to yes. Bishop in the sense that they're artists who were resolutely unsentimental, I think occasionally fierce, but never mean. And there's also this, there's always this, you know, there's always this love of the world. So I, I just, it occurred to me this connection. I thought I would. There's a, one of her wonderful unpublished poems uh, is her poem about Buster Keaton mm -hmm. called Keaton, mm -hmm. which is, and it, f it just absolutely figures that Keaton, of all the screen comedians or the silent comedians, would be the one who is most attractive to Bishop. And the last line of that poem is, I am not sentimental. Mm. And it starts out, I think, I will be good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. And what Helen Levitt loves is ordinary people, just people on the street and animals and, animals. and, and children, children. Yeah. and children especially. And the With mask you know, on. If you want to know about the world, look at children and watch them interacting on the street. Mm -hmm. And she certainly had that. I think it's a great combination. Mm -hmm. She would have loved that. 
Right. I always think of Walker Evans when I think of filling station, though. Mm. Yeah, you know, because right. It's like right. a Walker Evans photograph, yeah, only is. the tone is a little different. Right. Mm. <laughs> All right, well, we've gone over about almost 15 minutes. Wow. <laughs> well, it speaks to. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to thank everybody for coming and to thank this wonderful, wonderful group. I think Elizabeth Bishop has gotten an appreciation. She